a Toronto woman was hospitalized after becoming addicted to vaping, but she is not alone. Reporter Nathan Singh investigates into the dangers of vaping. Reporter Chelsea Gould took a tour of Ryerson to find out why there are so many pianos on campus and what purpose they serve. Does virtual reality have the ability to increase empathy and make people more understanding towards each other? Reporter Manur Mubarak decided to find out. Good afternoon, Ryerson. My name is Anastasia Andrick, and welcome to Ryers this edition of Ryersonian TV. The FCJ Refugee Center says the increased tuition fees facing asylum seekers are a human rights issue. Reporter Roxanne Stewart-Johnson shares a personal story on this. Take a look. It was two years ago when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted his open invitation welcoming asylum seekers fleeing persecution, terror, and war. But refugee claimants have another challenge if they're thinking of continuing their post-secondary education while awaiting the lengthy determination process. Here at Ryerson University, students who are refugee claimants still awaiting the determination process face international fees, which according to youth advocate Natasha Rowlings, can be up to three times higher than domestic fees. Rowlings, the Access to Education and Youth Coordinator at the FCJ Refugee Centre, says the increased fees facing asylum seekers are barring access to a human right. The right to education is a human right for all people, and that should include post-secondary education. And putting this enormous financial barrier to accessing it for people who are in already precarious positions is extraordinarily prohibitive and it is a systemic barrier that I think really needs to be addressed. As a refugee myself who went through the determination process while going to Ryerson, I was also nonplussed at how a single mother with a disability fleeing domestic violence and psychiatric abuse in Jamaica would be expected to pay twice as much as my classmates. Martin Gensherman, a former adjudicator of the Immigration and Refugee Board, explains the circumstances that differentiate refugees from international students who choose to study abroad. Well, there are people that aren't able to live safely in their country that they were born in or the country that they have uh, citizenship in. There's people that have to flee their country because of their race, religion, their nationality, their political opinion, and then there's a catch-all miscellaneous, and that's a member of a particular social group. Once a claimant has been determined a convention refugee by Canada's Immigration and Refugee Board, they are now entitled to domestic fees. They also qualify for the Ontario Student Assistance Program, but the determination process is lengthy and can even take years. Uh, some people have to wait up to five years lately to have their refugee claims finally heard and to get a final decision from the refugee board. If they go to the refugee appeal division, it can be a year. If they get a negative decision from the refugee appeal division, there can be a, an appeal made to the federal courts, and that can take up to another year. Youth advocate Natasha Rowlings explains how the children of asylum-seeking families who have managed to go through the Canadian high school levels also find themselves barred from continuing on to post-secondary education. In one of our youth network meetings years ago, and this was a recurring theme, that students who would come here and who perhaps had precarious status, no status, or refugee status, would go through high school here for free and then get to this wall and not be able to go on to post-secondary education. And so it's something that our organization has been advocating for for quite a number of years. Ryerson University's president and vice chancellor, Dr. Mohamed Lachimi, told the Ryersonian that charging refugee claimants international fees was not the university's decision. We have two categories, domestic and international students. Those are determined by the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities. The registrar's office has no control over that transition. During the transition process, we don't consider them refugees until it's approved. And these are not our rules. Those are set by the government. Though Dr. Lachimi explained that the decision to grant refugee claimants domestic fees was out of his hands, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities gave a response as to whether they were strictly responsible for the decision to charge refugee claimants international fees. They replied, 
Ontario's post-secondary institutions have considerable autonomy over matters involving international students. Colleges and universities develop individual policies regarding recruitment, admissions processes and enrollment targets. They also have independence over programming and tuition fees for international students. Each institution sets its international fees based on market forces, including reputation, demand, and competition. The Ministry of Colleges and Universities determines which students are eligible for enrollment-based operating grants. While grant eligibility generally applies to domestic students, there are some international, non-citizen, or permanent residents who are eligible for operating grants from the ministry. Youth advocate Natasha Rowlings also described how the FCJ Refugee Centre was able to negotiate domestic fees at York University. Our centre was instrumental a couple of years ago in establishing a, pro a program, a bridging program at York University, which enables precarious migrant students to study at the university for domestic fees. International students are of financial benefit to every single institution. Not only financial benefit, of course, they provide other assets to the school that they, that they appreciate, but an international student tuition is of higher profit to the institutions themselves. And so I think that that's one of the challenges is having some schools or a school take a stand in a moral and an ethical stand um, and kind of relinquish that financial gain for the moral gain. In the meantime, it seems refugee claimants who choose to continue their education at Ryerson University will also continue to face much higher fees. I'm Roxanne Stewart Johnson reporting for the Ryersonian. Over 1,600 cases of lung disease have been reported in the U.S. alone due to vaping. The popular alternative to smoking became a hit for its wide variety of fruity and minty flavors. But how much do people really know about the dangers that come with vaping? One Toronto woman discovered just that after being hospitalized for her vaping addiction this year. Reporter Nathan Singh has more. When I wake up in the morning, it would always be like, I fall asleep with it right beside my head. I wake up in the morning, it's right beside my head. First thing I do before I open my eyes, it was vape. Like, it was insane. I was seriously so addicted to it. Um, but then also the taste, I love the mint pod. That was my favorite, because I like like the minty fresh. More than 1,600 cases of lung disease are now tied to vaping in the U.S. alone. Vaping is convenient, accessible, and discreet while containing a higher concentration of nicotine compared to cigarettes. Before when I was smoking, um, if I went up a flight of stairs, a few flights of stairs, I would uh, have difficulty breathing. Uh, since I have like started uh, vaping, I don't have breathing difficulties. It's been marketed as an alternative to smoking, but having only been introduced in Canada in 2004, how much do we really know of the negative impacts of vaping? In September 2019, 20-year-old Bryn Bowman Howe was hospitalized due to inflammation and fluid in her lungs. Doctors believe her health problems were related to excessive vape use. The way the doctors are kind of handling it right now is because they, they don't have proof, right? So they can't, they can't be like, okay, this is happening for, from this exact reason, but they're very like serious about it in the way that they're just like stop now because we don't know anything so they were just like very serious about it and they were like you can't breathe and and like that is what's making you not be able to breathe they just kind of like look at you and you know you feel a bit stupid because they're like they're like writing it out for you like you're putting chemicals into your lungs and it's like burning them you know so how many pills are you taking a day? Uh, seven, or well, eight, and then it goes down every like four days. At the hospital, Bryn was given an oxygen mask and steroids for her lungs to help the inflammation. She's been going to her family doctor once every week for the past two months. She was prescribed eight prednisone pills a day to reduce inflammation in her lungs and three different inhalers to help with her breathing. She also uses nicotine patches to prevent her from vaping. That's just that. 
U.S. health officials are still unsure of the specific cause of illnesses linked to vaping. They are investigating the ingredients that dissolve the nicotine, cannabis, and even caffeine compounds in e-cigarette liquids, which include solvents such as propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. The Toronto Star learned Ontario is taking extra precaution to reduce teens from vaping by banning the promotion of vape products in convenience stores starting January 1, 2020. But this doesn't consider advertisements displayed throughout the city or specialty vape shops that have storefronts sprinkled all over the downtown core. We have regulation here in Canada and uh, what you're seeing from our products is that they have to have an ISO standard lab. The regulation is going through Health Canada. A lot of the manufacturers are part of the Electronic uh, Cigarette Technology Association. So they're meeting those standards um, and it's, it's just simply not black market where someone can just mix your, your liquid for you and you don't know what's in it. You know, we, we see this as a seri serious issue that's going on in the U.S. Um, and as vapors, we all want to know what was it, you know, like not just the headline, but what was it that caused that? Because like myself, I'm a long-term vapor. If there is risks, I'd like to know. But I feel like the, the evidence hasn't been presented yet. U.S. health officials say the potential risks of vaping include severe lung injury, lung disease, and even death. Even though they are considered safe for consumption, Health Canada is now researching the potentially harmful effects of inhaling the chemicals used to flavor vape products. And although e-cigarettes were initially designed as an alternative to help cigarette smokers quit, some have taken up vaping without ever having smoked a cigarette. You know, we ask them a lot of questions when they come in. So how many cigarettes do you smoke? And, you know, what are their goals? And people who come in um, that are asking sort of questions about vaping and that aren't smokers, we are often in a position to tell them you should breathe air, drink water. You know, you, sh you know, if you're not already ingesting nicotine, then there's no need to start doing it because it is addictive. And all my friends started getting jewels and they didn't even smoke cigarettes before. And I remember being like, you guys are crazy. You don't even smoke cigarettes you're just getting yourself a nicotine addiction like for no reason and then I remember I started using it and then every time I'd go out with them I'd be using it and it's like the convenience of it you know what I mean like you go to a bar you can just go to the bathroom you don't have to go outside just go and vape it started with the jewel mm -hmm. and then I got the Novo which I really liked but there was no it would it would break like and the juice gets in your mouth, which I really hated, because something about that, the juice tastes like just disgusting chemicals. And I remember it would like make my mouth, mouth like numb when the juice would like touch my tongue. And the, so that was what would happen with that one. Stop that one. Then I got this one. Yeah, this one was good. It lasted me probably, it's still full of juice. <laughs> it lasted me like a really long time, but, oh, it's on. Oh, that's tempting. But, <laughs> um, E-cigarettes can deliver high amounts of nicotine per pod, up to the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. Juul recently stopped selling flavored pods in the US that were considered to be more appealing to young people. These flavors include some of their most popular, like mango and creme. The amount of nicotine, cannabis, or caffeine compounds in vape pods mixed in with the wide range of attractive flavors makes vaping intriguing as much as it's addicting. How long has it been? It's been... Okay, well... <laughs> Yesterday I had like a hit of a vape. I've been having like kind of like one hit a day. Like it's still my parents like just like have like one hit, but so you're still vaping. No, I'm not. <laughs> but you're taking a hit a day. I'm like okay. Well, I had like one hit yesterday, but then I didn't the day before. I've been having nicotine patches. Oh, okay. So that's been really helping. Vaping is accessible. It's trendy, and it can be pretty addictive. You can pretty much rip a vape anywhere, so it's no wonder why it becomes second nature to frequent users. Ever since the first reports of mysterious illnesses and deaths came out linked to vaping, it seems as though more damaging news on vaping keeps on coming out. But just walking around downtown Toronto and on this university campus, people are vaping just as they did before. So even if they know what's going on, it's clear that the possible negative repercussions of excessive vaping aren't enough to deter all vapors. Yes. My little sister is eight years old and she knows what a jewel is. 
And I remember that was when I was like, no, because that scared me. Like the thought of my little sister vaping. And then I, I think about like all these kids, like grade sixes, grade sevens are vaping. Like I had an old teacher at my old school and her daughter had one. And like she was talking, she confided in me about it. Cause she was like, I know nothing about this. And I looked at her and I was like, get her to stop now. I remember when I was growing up, cigarettes were a scary thing. Cigarettes were like, don't do it, causes cancer. Just don't, you know? And it was like, every kid was like, ew, they're smoking cigarettes, that's so gross. But like with vaping, it's not seen like that at all to kids. Like it's literally like glamorized. There's like ads on the television saying like, do this, it's great, tastes great. Like it's actually the most messed up thing ever, I think. Um, but yeah, if someone were to ask me, I would just like, seriously tell them not to. I would probably just tell them my story and be like, don't. <laughs> Feeling hungry, Ryerson? One study found that 17% of Canadians are eating breakfast only once or twice a week. Many people consider breakfast to be the most important meal of the day. But how many people are actually eating breakfast regularly? Our reporter Arya DeLima spoke to 110 Ryerson students to find out. Take a look. For many, Breakfast is considered to be the most important meal of the day. This meal is what provides you with the initial energy and nourishment you need to get going after your body has been stagnant for an extended period of time. Uh, I usually just eat breakfast every single day, like when I can. I'm the type of person who needs like eight hours of sleep and their breakfast to function properly throughout the day. So if I don't eat breakfast, I'm usually feeling like pretty bad. We surveyed 110 Ryerson University students to see how common it is for them to eat breakfast. 42 students said that they never, or usually don't, eat breakfast. Normally, like, maybe at least once a week. But then I wake up late, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I really have to run to, like, my lab or my class. I don't really have time to eat. Sometimes I just grab at home, like, a croissant, a pop tart, a piece of bread, a banana, like, something small. Maybe once a week. I usually sleep in. And then by the time I wake up, it's already time to go to class, so I don't have time to eat. Like, it does help you focus the class because when you're like, when you don't eat and you're hungry, your stomach's scrolling and then you can't focus on your notes and you're just like, wow, I want food right now, what should I eat? And that's the only thing that's on your mind. Out of the 110 students, 68 students said that they always or usually eat breakfast. I, I can't, I literally can't open my eyes in the morning without eating breakfast. I eat so much breakfast sometimes that I don't even eat lunch or dinner. I don't drink coffee, but like breakfast for me is my coffee. It's like, I really need that energy in the morning waking up. According to a study conducted by Statista in 2019, 17% of Canadians only eat breakfast once or twice a week. It is important because right now I'm yeah, so super hungry. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why there are so many pianos on campus? Our reporter Chelsea Gould investigated why the pianos are there and what they're exactly used for. You may be surprised to find out. Check this out. Have you ever found yourself walking through campus, hearing music and wondering who is playing? It might have been Tyler Richardson. He's one of the many Ryerson community members who come out late at night searching for a piano to play. Some of us don't have the money to spend on an electric piano, me being one of those people. Um, so in order to actually get the practice in for the instrument itself, um, naturally I'm going to need to find another way in order to get the piano um, playing that I need. And Ryerson is that outlet for me. I was just going into rooms individually in between classes. I'd just walk around campus, see what I could find. I pretty much bounce between three rooms of adequate pianos whenever I can. There's a small community of, of piano players who are here and I have their contact information and I've just met them here and we sometimes convene and share what we learn. Now I'm still the kid of E major, but let me go to the minor. What you may not have realized is that many of the pianos seen in the lecture rooms of Kerr Hall and Podium are part of music classes at Ryerson. Sean Bellavidi is a contract lecturer at Ryerson who teaches courses in music theory. I use them to demonstrate to students particularly what something sounds like, what it looks like, and in the case of the um, musicianship course, we use it as a device for understanding how music works. Across all the concepts we've learned in class, they're sort of brought to life with a piano in the classroom. And it's nice too as well to have an acoustic piano in the room rather than, say for example, a keyboard or something like that because 
it feels more authentic and it's a nice warm sound to hear in the morning, especially when we're waking up pretty early for class. However, many of the pianos aren't of the greatest quality. They're out in the open. They get played by musicians of all levels, and they get played a lot. It has some weaknesses. It's susceptible to the cold, the heat, um, the dryness, the humidity. Things gotta get out of tune, and the more you tune them, the more the more repairs they require. It looks sturdy, but then little bits and pieces start flying off as someone takes off the cover to see the inner workings of the piano, which I sometimes do, then to put it back requires a little bit of skill. And sometimes those things are not there, and then once it's open, things fall inside. According to music professor Jillian Turnbull, who wrote in an email, we tune our pianos every year and get them repaired to the extent that they're repairable. Unfortunately, because the pianos are donated, they do come to us in various states of heavy use and disrepair, and there's only so much we can do. We're looking into replacing the pianos in Kerr Hall South 251, since they are both no longer usable. If Ryerson uh, wants to move forward with music, uh, if you're starting a new music program, especially a music major, um, or run these music courses, I think it sh should be important to have the corresponding tools and corresponding instruments, uh, faculties as well. Uh, so if there was some funds allocated towards having upkept pianos, for example, I think that would be a very good thing for courses such as this. Oakham House has two pianos that community members used to be able to access, but since the beginning of the school year, they have been closed indefinitely. According to management, they are broken from abuse. But for now, all Ryerson community members can still access pianos in the Kerr Hall and Podium building. As long as they aren't misused, these pianos will remain staples of the Ryerson community. For the Ryersonian, I'm Chelsea Gould. A study by Stanford University last year found that virtual reality can make people more compassionate compared to other forms of media. Ryerson School of Journalism uses virtual reality techniques to help students help tell stories. Reporter Manur Mubarik has more on this. Virtual reality is a three-dimensional image or environment you can interact with. The idea of virtual reality as an empathy machine was widely popularized four years ago after a TED Talk by Chris Milk. He's the CEO of the virtual reality company Within. He said that virtual reality has the ability to increase empathy and make people more understanding towards each other. So it's a machine, but through this machine we become more compassionate, we become more empathetic, and we become more connected, and ultimately, we become more human. A study by Stanford University last year said that virtual reality can make people more compassionate compared to other forms of media. At Ryerson School of Journalism, virtual reality techniques are being used to help students tell stories. Hong Kong 360 is a summer intensive course that we launched in 2018. And what it was, uh, was an opportunity to create an international reporting course in which our students uh, traveled to Hong Kong um, to uh, report stories about uh, culture and history and um, the challenges facing people in, in, in that city. Um, it was also an opportunity for us to dip our toes into 360 video and virtual reality documentary. Uh, which we hadn't really previously offered at the RSJ, but this was a really great uh, chance to be able to uh, acquire some of this equipment and, and kind of experiment with a different kind of storytelling. And um, there is uh, a lot of evidence to suggest that a virtual experience, an immersive storytelling experience, actually does increase uh, the sense of empathy one can have for a subject. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with the, um, the kind of neurological trickery that happens and when you, when you put on a VR headset, your brain uh, actually does feel like you're there to a certain extent. Um, I'm not sure just by strapping on a VR headset you're gonna feel you know, more empathy for a subject. I think it has to be done in, uh, in a way that brings the audience to feel like they're part of the story and that's when that magic can happen. Nimo Chanit is the director of The Holy City. It's a virtual reality game. What we've done is we've created a gamified documentary experience that allows people from around the world to travel uh, virtually to Jerusalem. The game allows a user to visit the holy sites in Jerusalem 
Learn more about the city and the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faith. Each religion has its own story in the game. Nimot Chanit says while he hopes his piece will be used as a tool for empathy, it's not something that you can measure. Can we achieve it? Are we good enough at what we are to, to say that we've achieved it? There's no real way to monitor that. We would never know if we succeeded apart from hopefully having some reviews being uh, mentioned or having people walk up to us and tell us they've enjoyed the piece. Not every creator believes virtual reality has the ability to increase empathy. One of the creators of Resourced said she's skeptical of this. Resourced is a project about Toronto's frontline workers. It's a documentary interview series which is presented in virtual reality. You hear the stories of frontline workers while engaging in interactive levels. I think that empathy is always reliant between the, the people that are, that are present. It's, it's not the hardware, um, it's that like active relating, it's, that acti the it's the storytelling, it's a very old technique that's really, that's really like the empathy machine. Uh, like the people, like we ourselves are the empathy machine. Virtual reality's ability to increase empathy is still being debated today. Some people believe it can increase empathy, others say there's no way to measure empathy, and some people remain skeptical. While there isn't a consensus on this, the medium is still being used to tell a variety of different stories. If you go to Ryerson or live near the corner of Young and Gould Streets, then you've probably heard of Curry Face. Located in the outdoor food market across Ryerson Student Learning Center, Curry Face serves up Indian and Asian food. Our reporters Arya DeLima and Maria Saru visited the outdoor food market for a first-hand look. Check it out. 27-year-old Amit Bangar is the owner of Curry Face, located in the outdoor food market at the corner of Young Street and Gould Street, right outside Ryerson Student Learning Center. Amit is a young entrepreneur who has always aspired to make a career for himself in the culinary world. Well, <laughs> I can honestly say it was when I was around four, four years old and my aunt told me that girls like guys that could cook and I was like all right I guess I'm gonna cook now and I've never changed my mind so it's just me being stubborn to a point where I just got good good with it so I've always worked in restaurants my whole life I already knew that this is what I wanted to do like from an early age at first I wanted to open up a snack bar uh, and then from there it turned into maybe opening up a food truck but when this opportunity came up it was very hard to pass up on it was just something different that I thought that you know, would be a good start to my hopefully, you know, larger career. Ahmed's inspiration comes from his restaurant experience, his culinary studies at Humber College, and his childhood. Well, a lot of this stuff is like Indian street food, which is everything that I grew up with as a kid. I was taking that inspiration and time, not to put my own twist on it, but I was seeing everything as a chef first and as an Indian second, instead of the other way around. Um, a big thing for me was not thinking about what Indian food should be, rather what Indian food can be. But using all of the uh, experience I had in the past at different restaurants, different techniques, um, it kind of works together in a way that, you know, we're doing something different that not a lot of people are used to having. I kind of want to bring something different where I bring restaurant experience, where people can actually have, you know, higher quality food, but in a different setting. And a big part of what I want to be about is creating a social space with people. Amit's main focus is to build a positive reputation for himself and show his customers, many of them being Ryerson students, how much he cares and takes pride in his work. Every day it's always going grocery shopping, always spending like at least a few hours here like organizing, cleaning, you, like when working, sometime working in a restaurant and you're behind a kitchen, behind many doors, you don't get that connection unless you go out there and you make it, you know, happen. With here, it's it's very much, I see who they are, I can greet them myself. Every step of service is controlled through me. I mean, it's the whole spirit of hospitality. It's the reason why we get into, like, you know, into cooking is to, well, meet girls, but, <laughs> but uh, um, to create experiences for people and to create good food and have a connection with that. This is very much a passion project. This is what I do, this is all I've ever done. I am just equally as passionate about being here as I am dedicated to it. So 
that's why I don't mind standing here for at least 12 hours a day cooking and cutting onions all day long, right? It's because it's what I love to do and I'm dedicated towards it and this is all I want to do. Lots of exciting news in the sports world for Ryerson recently. With a recap of all the semester's big sports stories, here's sports reporters Musa Imran and Taylor West. <laughs> Hi Ryerson, I'm Taylor West and here's your sports recap for the semester, highlighting what's new and how our sports teams are doing. Ryerson celebrated its first homecoming in 40 years on September 20th when Rams men's hockey defeated the Queens Gales 4-1. This semester, Luis Cowan stepped in as athletic director at Ryerson, replacing Ivan Joseph and interim director Jeff Giles. Before coming to Ryerson, she served as Vice President of Students at the University of British Columbia. Ryerson has a new rugby team who kicked off their inaugural season on September 26th with a win against Queens. The team currently plays in the Scholars League and their efforts to be recognized on a varsity level are ongoing. Rams women's volleyball ranks second in the nation with a record of 8-1. Their only loss of the season came at the hands of the Toronto Varsity Blues on November 25th. Rams women's basketball ranks six nationally with a five and two record and are coming off a win against Ontario Tech on November 20th. In their first weekend of the season, the men's res wrestling squad has earned themselves ninth place on the national leaderboard, collecting 20 points so far. That's it for your sports update. I'm Taylor West, now back to the studio. For the latest in entertainment news and to see what's happening with your favorite celebrities these days, we have reporter Aiden Lee to tell you. What's up Ryersonian TV, my name is Aiden Lee and here are the top entertainment stories of November 2019. First up, John Legend takes the title for this year's People's Sexiest Man Alive. In this month's issue, John said everyone's going to be picking me apart to see if I'm sexy enough to hold this title. I'm also following Idris Elba, which is not fair and is not nice to me. The 40-year-old father of two is the fourth man of color to be awarded this title. Others include Idris Elba, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Denzel Washington. Taking it overseas, it looks like K-pop fans are still protesting the departure of Monster X member Wano. The K-pop idol made a sudden departure earlier this month after a list of financial mismanagement allegations. Fans have taken to Twitter to express their disappointment and are urging Starship Entertainment to take him back. Fans have been posting sticky notes outside the company's building in protest. Others have gathered funds to buy billboards in New York City's Times Square. As of now, there is no update on whether or not the idol will return to the group, but Starship Entertainment has put out a statement saying they are taking legal action. Speaking of finances, it looks like Kylie Jenner is probably somewhere counting her money. The makeup mogul reportedly sold 51% of Kylie Cosmetics to the Cotty company for $600 million. Kylie said, I'm excited to partner with Hadi to continue to reach more fans with Kylie's cosmetics and Kylie's skin around the world. Next up, if you're a fan of the hit 90s sitcom Friends, you may be in for a special surprise. News of a reunion first came up when Jennifer Aniston posted this photo to her Instagram. Later in an interview with Ellen DeGeneres, Jennifer said, we would love for there to be something, but we don't know what that something is. So we're just trying. We're working on something. So, could there be a reboot of some sort? Let us know what you think by tweeting us at the Ryersonian on Twitter. This has been your entertainment update. I'm Aiden Lee. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back in the winter semester. And be sure to check out the new issue of the Ryersonian on newsstands and on the Ryersonian.ca now. For the Ryersonian, I'm Anastasia Andrick.